So, uh, as usual, when I have made a PowerPoint, uh, it's too long. I'm sure it's too long. <laughs> so we may not get through all of it because I'd much rather have a discussion than just, you know, I could easily talk for the rest of the time uh, because this is what I spend most of my time thinking about. But also this, a big part of the point of this is that this is a subject where I often feel I'm not on the same page as other people in conversations I find myself in, which may mean that I'm either explaining things too much that are already obvious, or that I'm glossing over things that uh, leaving people going, what, what was that? So I might as well stop and just ask if we're clear as we go through. Uh, I'm calling this relationship to nature in a mass extinction. And relationship to nature is the point of this presentation, but it's not what I'm gonna be talking about mostly. Um, because I feel that, I think we're probably mostly on the same page about that being an important thing. And that that is a feature of this group uh, and its wider network, that we're paying attention to relationship to nature as, as something important. What I wanna talk about is the context, as it appears to me, of doing that <laughs> or talking about that in a mass extinction and what that means and how that means that a lot of the ways that people talk about relationship to nature don't seem to make a lot of sense or seem to have a lot left out. So I'm talking mostly about that context of a mass extinction. Uh, and I've written, you know, towards a set of stupid cosmological questions because I feel, like, I don't know about we, but I at least am at the point of looking for questions rather than looking for the answers to those questions and basic questions. Um, maybe someone out there has answered all of them or different people have answered them, but I, I, I barely even know what the questions are at the moment. But they're questions of where we are um, in the world. They're questions about meaning. Obviously, you need some kind of relationship to nature, not necessarily a good one, just in order to survive, to eat. Uh, and breathe but i'm talking about how you see your relationship to nature and how that's important to your sense of meaning uh and yeah in the in this particular context that we find ourselves in and this uh, i seem to have discovered the problem there we go okay so uh on this call, before we started recording, you know, we were talking about the purpose of life and mortality. And not the purpose of mortality, but the purpose of life in the context of mortality. Uh, and I just want to draw attention to how much that is a thing we talk about, how much that's a thing we have to talk about, how much that is a thing that we have had to talk about since, you know, we were able to talk as a species. Um, and I've put this up because this is something from one of the Star Wars prequels where Yoda says death is a natural part of life. And it's a cliche. And I think the point in the film is that it's a cliche and it's not a very helpful thing to say. But you hear it and you know that there's so much has already been said on that. And if you say death is a natural part of life, that's something people know. If you're talking about extinction, you know, extinction has only been recognized as a thing. Species extinction has only been recognized as a thing since the 17th century. Um, is extinction a natural part of life? People tend to seem unsure. Um, the When you hear people suggest that it is a natural part of life is when you're talking about a mass extinction. There's this idea that there's this sort of background rate of extinction. Uh, which happens normally, and then there are mass extinctions where it happens much faster. So in that case, is, is a mass extinction a natural part of life? And what about this one, which is caused by us? I, there's a basic problem of, a very basic problem of, of sense making there. And it's 
despite all this, obviously we are not at all good as a rule at dealing with death. So I don't want to, I want to emphasize the challenge of the idea that you can deal in any way psychologically with mass extinction. Um, are we in a mass extinction? I've been reading this book, uh, Other Lands by Thomas Halliday. It's, it's a very beautiful book and it's a journey through deep time. And the last section is about our current time. And here are a few of the facts that are mentioned in that section. And we're all used to this hearing this kind of fact, if not these particular ones now. Uh, the area of low oxygen bottom waters in the sea is octupled, octupled since the 1950s. Ocean acidification threatens the dissolution of all, of all the world's coral reefs. And the word dissolution there isn't a metaphor. The CO2 rise at the moment is easily exceeding the average, um, although there's a very important issue of temporal resolution there, but the average uh, over the end Permian mass extinction, generally considered to be the worst mass extinction of all. And the total man-made material on the planet weighs about the same amount as the total living material. As I say, those hearing those kinds of facts, they're mind boggling and they're also familiar to us at the moment. Hearing them situated at the end of this book, having read the book before, it's obvious that the name for this age that is a mass extinction. You know, that that's the story that easily comes to mind. Um, normally, if, you, if you're talking about, you know, whether we're in a mass extinction, the, the conversation starts with a definition of a mass extinction, which will say something like 75% of the planet's species are lost in a mass extinction. We'll, we'll go on to argue whether we are losing that number of species at the moment. Uh, but, you know, you run into trouble quite quickly. Why 75%? It's an arbitrary figure. Um, what's a species? It, it's, that's a very difficult question, even if you're talking about living species, and the, the term may well be meaningless. Uh, but if you're trying to compare living species with fossil species, it's much more complicated still. And the whole thing, you know, can sound a bit like the what is a planet, you know, is Pluto a planet? That kind of thing where the definition is supposed to help you, but it very quickly takes you down a rabbit hole and distracts you. Um, so I, I don't want to talk about that now. Broadly, yes, if you do go down these uh, this rabbit hole, yes, this is definitely a mass extinction. Um, but I want to focus on the idea that a mass extinction is is a particular kind of event. Uh, and I put this picture here of the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse because the point is that they have individual names. War, famine and pestilence aren't just called mass death. And that the character of this event is, I mean, it's a very obvious for a really, really important point, bad, very, very bad. These are the most terrible things that have happened in the history of life on Earth, um, kind of by definition. But also, it's part of a, of a scientific cosmology. And if you don't see the world in those terms, uh, you can sort of reject it as even a useful thing to, to talk about. But even if you do see the world, at least partly in, in those terms, it, it's, 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 the words don't tend to resonate very much. Mass extinction doesn't have the, the power of the word war. Um, and a more, a more technical point is that in a mass extinction, the rate at which things change is often very critical. Long term, you know, in terms of hundreds of millions of years, life could do with more carbon dioxide. There's something of a worry about it running out if we were worried of things over that time scale. Uh, but at the moment, the problem is that it's increasing at a very fast rate. And finally, and I think this is really important, 
a mass extinction isn't the same thing at all as a civilizational collapse. So one way of talking about our current age is that in terms of this idea of civilizational collapse, societal collapse, and this is a terrible thing, and the idea of mass extinction can sort of get swept under that as if they're the same thing, but they're not. For one uh, example of how they're not the same thing, uh, I want to talk a bit about Easter Island. And I'm, I'm guessing that people are aware of this. Uh, but basically, in the 1990s, in sort of global discourse, but particularly popularized by Jared Diamond, but he didn't invent it, he didn't uh, invent the story. Uh, there was a myth about the collapse of Easter Island. And it goes went more or less like this. That the Polynesian Islanders' actions led to the destruction of their forests, the extinction of all their native land birds, there were five or six species, uh, the destruction of the massive seabird colonies of the islands. Uh, there, there are still some seabirds nesting there, but nothing like what they were. Um, and then the, their society of the islanders, the Rapa Nui, uh, rested on these things, and then it collapsed. And by the time Europeans arrived, the island was a post-apocalyptic wasteland with people eating either rats or each other, and it generally being awful. And this is a myth in the sense that it is not true. It is a myth in that it's not true. And what you will hear now is what I'm calling here a colonialism myth. The island society was thriving when Europeans arrived. Uh, and it was destroyed, as in so many other places, by the arrival of Europeans themselves and their diseases. Um, my point is here that this is true, but it's still a myth in the sense that it is a story by which we structure reality. And nonetheless, as a story, it leaves things out. And what it leaves out is that as far as we know at the moment, the first part of the collapse myth is true. The Polynesian Islanders' actions did lead to the destruction of their forests. Exactly which actions is debatable, but that is apparently true. And death and the extinction of all native land birds and the destruction of the seabird colonies. But after that, their society did not collapse. In the context of this small island, it was a mass extinction. If that island had been, you know, planet Earth, you would call that a mass extinction. But they carried on. So I was in a conversation uh, the other week with a, an activist, um, very brief conversation with an activist in, in New Zealand. And it's just stuck in my mind as an example of, of the kind of conversation that I'm usually not in because I, I, I avoid it. Um, we were she was talking about uh, Maori rights. And I asked this question. So in, if you're working on this, what do you think? Do you think anything about the mower? This is a, a statue of a, a sorry, a statue, a skeleton of a, of a giant mower, uh, the largest known bird of all time, um, extinct after the arrival of the Maori. And she said, "So, do you mean this story that the Maori are bad ancestors because they killed the mower, and because of that, they don't deserve rights to their land?" So this is a, a you know very much a colonialism. Uh, framework and I sort of said well no no I you know I don't think any I don't have any crystallized view on this I've never even been to New Zealand uh, and but I'm not asking what you think about what other people think what do you think and she said well I think people are you know people arrived they were hungry and desperate no one's perfect and the loss of one species doesn't mean that all of the value of there's no value at all to Maori knowledge of the land um, and then our conversation ended because we were in a breakout room on our Zoom call. Uh, but, you know, I don't think either that this has anything, any bearing on the value of Maori knowledge of the land or whether Maori have rights to their land. And it doesn't mean that, you know, my people were allowed to take the land from their people because their ancestors killed the mower. But the thing about this, her story, is that it sort of sweeps the extinction of the MOA aside as a, a sort of minor detail. Um, the MOA wasn't just one species. There were the giant MOA, uh, 
one species from North and South Island, largest birds ever to have lived, as I said, the little bush mower, the coastal mower, the stout legged mower, the upland mower, the heavy footed mower, mantas mower, and the rare crested mower, which is the only one whose bones have not been found in Maori middens. There were also the New Zealand swan, the giant flightless goose, two species from each island, uh, three ducks, one terrestrial, uh, two birds of prey, uh, the Ailes' harrier and the giant's eagle. This is an eagle so large it was able to actually prey on the mower. Um, three rails, uh, including a coot. The adsbill, which I can't really tell you what an adsbill is. It's just itself. Again, a North and a South Island species. An owl at nightjar, the New Zealand raven, and two of these birds called New Zealand wrens, uh, both flightless. They're very few uh, species of flightless passerine bird. They're all from islands. They're all extinct. The last one, Lyle's wren, uh, was called the Stevens Islands wren because it vanished from most of New Zealand after the Maori arrival, but it survived on one offshore islet and specimens were sent to London by the lighthouse keeper on that island, who at about the same time had a cat and the cat was pregnant and you know there's not that clear record of what happened but the species which had hung on on this tiny island for uh whatever it was a thousand years what it had been wiped out from the, the rest of uh, new zealand was gone within a couple of years this is a picture of it it goes back further you know those are, I've, I've it might seem like i was telling a story about how Polynesians are destructive people, which is not so. Uh, it's just that Polynesians were the people who have been colonizing previously uninhabited islands fairly recently. But before that, as the islands and the continents were colonized by humans, species vanished. And, you know, this picture shows in North America, Australia and South America in turn, I think it's just Eastern North America. I'm not quite sure whether there isn't a grizzly bear there, but uh, the species in gray are the species that were lost and the others are the species that were sti are still there. We can't be absolutely certain, but maybe there are some exceptions, but probably all those species in grey would still be there if our you know, human beings hadn't arrived in those continents. There used to be an idea that this happened in a burst in the Pleistocene, and then subsequently there was a lull until the present day, but really that doesn't match up. And my point is here, this isn't some kind of minor anomaly in the human story. This has been going on more or less since humans existed, probably, uh, depending when you think that was. This phrase, we are the Death Star, comes from a, a book uh, by David Quammen, but it, I, I just want to talk a bit, and this is a little bit harder to do in a PowerPoint presentation, but I want to talk a bit about some of the emotional reaction to this. I've been thinking recently in particular about this time, a uh, time in 2008 when I was, I was in the forest in Vietnam and reading Moby Dick. Uh, and this was the copy I had with this dramatic cover. Uh, a captain driven insane where a mad obsession risks his ship and his crew in dangerous pursuit of a whale, a whale that could lead them all to a watery grave. And, you know, Moby Dick is often seen as this story of a struggle between man and nature. And in chapter 105 of this story, um, I was, which is one of the parts about whales, Melville gives what would have sounded like a quite a convincing ecological argument about why humans will never cause the extinction of whales. Uh, he writes this in knowledge that humans called the, cause the near extinction of the bison and the extinction of the passenger pigeon. But he argues that the whales are different uh fairly convincingly at the time and he ends it off with this phrase the eternal whale will still survive and rearing upon the topmost crest of the equatorial flood spout his froth defiance to the skies and i feel there's something behind that in this his ability to portray the whale as this terrifying uh, um incomprehensible inhuman monster uh, uh, 
I've been thinking, you know, taking that in context with some other things. I was at a seminar, I think 2021, uh, by uh, somebody talking about the Vietnamese whale cult. There are temples in the south of Vietnam uh, with the skeletons of whales in them. And she said that these people, to these people, the whale is more important than Buddha and the ancestors put together. And somebody asked her, what do these people, they're all fishermen, what do they make of the container ships in the South China Sea that they see, these huge vessels? Uh, and she said, they, it's like they don't really see them. They're like things from another universe. They sort of don't exist in this world where they still worship the whale. And this is a phrase from, from the Dark Mountain Manifesto uh, from 2009. It's talking about a kind of writing that will give a picture of Homo sapiens, which are being from another world, or better, a being from our, our own, a blue whale, an albatross, a mountain hare might recognize as something approaching truth. And I feel like in that context, the idea that Moby Dick can give you an idea of is a book about the struggle between man and nature seems somehow completely backward. Really, if you want a book about the relationship between man and nature, the War of the Worlds is a much better example. And we're the Martians. Um, it's, it's, I'm not saying this is true. This is right. I'm just saying the situation we're in makes that a very easy and obvious conclusion. And just to quote the Dark Mountain Manifesto again, uh, at the end of a long section, it goes, climate change, which brings home at last our ultimate powerlessness. And this phrase, which could be seen as in opposition to the, uh, the whole philosophy of the Dark Mountain Manifesto from Stuart Brand. We are as gods and we better get good at it. He's talking about the idea, the, the, you know, the um, idea called eco-modernism that we have to take responsibility for our power over nature. And just looking at these phrases and wondering how these in any way could make sense to this bird driven extinct from its last redoubt in a year or two by a family of cats. Does it make any sense for the species that has caused the complete alteration of the planet's climate to see that as evidence of its powerlessness rather than its power. Um, so I think, if you're talking about nature, if you use the word nature, which a lot of people don't, including the you know, the Dark Mountain Manifesto without putting scare quotes around it. Um, if you do use the word, I think we tend to use it to mean something that is by definition outside, other that environment means the same thing. And in that sense, it's a word like people of color or indigenous people. You know, you could argue and very rightly in many ways that those are not useful terms because they're terms to denote outsiders and say, and, and therefore grant some kind of special privilege to the in-group. But as people would argue who advocate using those terms, if you avoid using them, you risk ignoring the power differential that's there. And if you do look at that power differential, the idea of talking about harmony with nature seems maybe a little bit dodgy. You know, can you have harmony when you have this much power? Um, but the difference between talking about power differentials with human groups is that there's no historical injustice that you can redress here. You know, nature doesn't control the means of production or anything like that. We actually you know, can't give up our power. All we can do is avoid using it for a while. But if you're talking about the geological timescale, the timescale of uh, which species exist, us giving up using it for a while doesn't mean anything. A while is not going to be long enough. A thousand years isn't long enough. So people who are concerned with social justice often are, you know, frustrated and furious with conservationists for 
working with the enemy, for trying to, in some way, work with institutions of capitalism or however it is that, that they particularly see it, rather than oppose them. And I think there is a sense in which we're doing that because it's easy for us to do that because we have no choice but to work with the enemy because we are the enemy, because we're human. And you don't want to say that, so you don't say it. Um, but it sort of needs saying if you're going to move beyond it or find something that it is helpful to say. Um, I wonder if it might be a good idea to stop there uh, and move to a discussion. What do people think? Give it a go. Let's go. Let's go with me. I'm wondering, I'm wondering, Nicholas, do you have a question to sort of put on the table, I wonder? Well, maybe, uh, yeah. Okay, so maybe I should, um, instead of just stopping, but go more towards the end. Um, obviously, there's a lot more to, to say, but I'll... Uh, I'll share my screen again. So I wanted to bring it back to <laughs> to where I came <laughs> into this group and why I came into this group. And we were all discussing this conversation between these three men, uh, Ian McGilchrist, um, Daniel Schmachtenberger and John Viveka. Um, and we had what for me was a really uh, interesting and productive discussion about this. Um, But there was an aspect to it as well where I'd sort of come to this group where because I felt I was in conversations before where people were taking a particular side and I was skeptical about that. And I, I got... I was... Um, I think saying a lot of things and that might have got given people, <laughs> left people wondering what my problem was. So I want to explain against this background, what was my problem and I come in with some biases. Um, And I hope that I've made it clear with what I was saying about the Easter Island and the Moa and the Pleistocene extinctions of animals from all the continents, that this idea that things went wrong in the Enlightenment just doesn't work for me. Um, now, these, in this conversation, things were not that simple. Uh, you know, in, in McGilchrist's work, he's the Enlightenment as part of a recurring tendency for the left brain to gain dominance. Maybe, you know, that happened at some point on all these islands and continents. And only when that happened did people go and slaughter all the remaining uh, moa or glyptodont or Maltese pygmy elephant or giant sloth lemur. I think it's impossible to know that. Um, but even if that's true, there's no way of stopping that happening in the future, uh, as far as I can see. Even if, you know, we can change our culture now, 
the fact that our culture can change means that we're still an agent of mass extinction. So that's still something we have to live with. Um, so my question is, my overarching question here is, how can you move forward trying to do things like set up a a community, a deliberately developmental space, do things like where you're considering your relationship to nature in where you get your food, in the grounds of wherever you're living, in whatever work you're doing. But without these stories that we're telling ourselves that we're creating a regenerative and sustainable culture and then that might be difficult it might be impossible we might fail the civilization might fall and we might start again but the creating a regenerative and civilization uh, and, and, and sustainable culture is still the answer in some way because it isn't <laughs> um and what could we do instead um uh, and I think that just to give a little bit more about my, my bias there, I think often I have you have this challenge that people at least who see themselves as sort of right brain types or in some way like that will dismiss Darwinism, dismiss what we know or dismiss, the, you know, what these things that we know about nature, either as, you know, just a version of the myth of progress, you know, evolution is the same as the myth of progress, you can write it off. Um, I think, you know, the book by Graeber and Wayne Grau, The Dawn of Everything, really does that, for example. Um, or as just part of the materialist paradise, just materialism, and we can, it, it's going to fall apart as part of the old paradigm and things will be okay. Or just not to really mention it or think about it at all. And I think there's a, if you see the, if you do have any version of the things went wrong in the enlightenment or the problem is modernity story, which I think, you know, there's a lot of reason to uh, believe in those stories. How do you cope with the challenges that modern scientific discoveries deal to the traditional spiritually rooted cosmologies? How do you deal with these, with what we know now about that there never was an Eden essentially? It seems like we keep grasping for Eden. So how can we find a way um, to talk about nature without in some way or another grasping for Eden in the past or in the future? Mm. Uh, it may still not sound very practical. No, nice question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, nicely summed up at the end. Mm. Let's do a round, shall we? <laughs> yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to start. Um, Go for it. I guess, first of all, it's it's nice, um, and it's more mental effort, which is nice, too, um, to have this kind of conversation, because with which is more open-ended, because I was in a talk yesterday, and there was this lady who was saying, just um, a bit like we discussed last time, she was like, this paper, this paper, this paper, this paper, this is my answer, <laughs> like, um, so it was very, um, well, it was a bit frustrating. So I, I, I do appreciate this format a lot more. Um, and a few things popped up for me, um, or I guess a few general comments. Um, and I guess one of the broad, yeah, I guess one of the, the broad things that, that came up for me, um, is that to... In, the, in this kind of like broad topic is to think of um, and maybe people do this, I'm not sure, but the way it kind of like came up for me is that nature um, trying to think about nature. Cause I think that's like a key part of this discussion. Like what do we mean when we say nature? Um, thinking of nature um, as the collection of many different worlds Um whatever however we say a world is defined whether like a species or whether like a certain bioregion is a certain world whatever it is it's just a collection of many worlds um and the human world um 
if it even makes sense to put it that way, the human world, um, always focuses on its own world first. Um, and that is, that is kind of, and that's what any species would do or any world would do, just focus on their own world. Um, so that's the way I was thinking of nature, I guess, nature as the collection of many different worlds. Um, and I, yeah, I think there's a lot of problems with how people might normally talk about the relationship between humans and nature with, uh, this idea of being um, like shepherds of nature. I don't think that um, really captures it too much. Um, I think there was maybe one more comment that I wanted to say. Um, yeah, I guess a little bit related to that. Um, the, the obvious point in this like very broad discussion discussion that humans are different like have a different world and are different than any anyone else in nature um so i guess those are the two very broad things that kind of stick out for me that nature is this collection of many different worlds and that the human world is obviously different and i guess also um this is also a bit of a, a tough discussion but needs to be reorganized in some way whatever whatever that whatever that way is um and even talking or yeah yeah i would say it needs to be reorganized in a certain way um and maybe i mean i'm not trying to put in the we should do this uh kind of more of a general it's a bit to me it seems like yeah there needs to be some reorganization and yeah i guess those 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 are my comments for now Could I ask just something to clarify on that? Mm, I didn't quite, yes, I, when you're saying it needs to be reorganized, I wasn't quite sure if you meant, you know, the discussion needs to be reorganized or. Oh, no, 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 world no, 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 no. I guess like, um, yeah, no, I meant like um, the, the quote unquote human world, like the, the way we do things needs to be reorganized. Not the discussion. However it may look, I, I have no idea how it might look, but. Mm. Hmm. I'd like to jump in on the, on the kind of more of the worldview kind of side, I suppose. Um, I think the whole, the whole dark mountain stuff. Um, I mean, it's a very, fine position to take if, if that turns you on <laughs> um i think the difficulty for me is that there is a tendency and i think this is i've seen i've seen this being written about in other ways um there can be a tendency to sort of nihilism or a nihil a nihilistic kind of perspective um or maybe a hopeless perspective oh it's all you know i mean and collapse i think that the word the word collapse sort of invites that in a way um and maybe that's deliberate i don't know you like, know oh, oh we're all going the whole thing's going to collapse and there's nothing we can do about it so and then i think the interesting question then is so and to me it's like if you accept that kind of at that kind of perspective or that kind of attitude towards the world which is not unreasonable at all i'm, I'm not at all challenging it um but i do have a question as to where do you um where is then the source of meaning for a for a tolerable life i suppose um and what comes to me actually is is actually a, a, a moving on from existentialism because I mean yeah I think uh, from what I've heard I've never really studied the existentialists but from what I've heard of existentialism it's more like okay everybody's got to work it out a bit like Brianism actually Brian as in the life of Brian you know you've all got to work it out for yourself um, and I think what I would where I would like to go and maybe this is just a personal thing I don't know but where I would like to go is to go beyond the individualistic well well it's all up to you you've got to create your own meaning in the world and that's it through to hey actually there is one thing better that you can do with that and the one thing better you can do 
is to um, band together. I don't know what the right word is. Come together with a group of people with whom you can develop these sort of bonds of um, trust, love even, and collectively work out what to do rather than just individually. And I, and w with the whole idea being that um, quite apart from anything else, you have a group of people around you who can validate what you're doing as meaningful because you have a community of meaning making. You have, you have a community of meaning making and therefore you, there's something which you can do about it. Actually, I think I think we see this to to extent in in in, in where, where it is and, and what what what's going on at the moment. Um, yeah, so I think that's really my main kind of what comes up for me. Um, but I'd be curious to know about what your position is is Nicholas. You know, I mean, that where do you go in terms of, you know, like not <laughs> throwing yourself in front of a bus or off a cliff, you know. <laughs> Um, where is life's meaning, you know, like in that narrative, well, it's not even a narrative in that sort of like meta narrative, almost in that sort of narrative, if there aren't any narratives that can save us narrative, um, where do you find meaning or where do you think, is it, is there a useful place to actually say, Hey, how about this approach to the world? Because I'm kind of with you very much in the sort of like skepticism about a, a lot of what's on offer at the moment. Mm. Um, but then what do we do about it? Mm. Uh, I'd love to answer that. Um, but Catherine has gone, but Paul Villas, I think, is yes. maybe still there. Yeah, maybe he can have a Yeah, good idea. Okay. Uh in the dark. <laughs> uh, sorry if you can't see me. My no camera problem. Is... Yeah. Uh, I I don't know if I can offer anything constructive, but uh, I just I will mention just uh, based on some keywords that I heard. You know, you, uh, Simon uh, mentioned nihilism and and what Becky was on screen, so I just. It, it just reminded my experience. I took a course beyond nihilism with Verbeke. And, and also I recently I started thinking, you know, what's this development? What, 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 what is common among developed systems or developed people? And I, I just noticed that, you know, and it, for example, in permaculture, and <laughs> it's uh, just taking I would frame it as you know taking some some costs upon yourself like you know some taking the beating and and i think i think in like in organic farming you you increase the costs and and i was thinking like why would you do that in a way like it it, it sometimes it is it increases pro productivity or, or quality sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes it seems just, 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 just a choice, you know, just like, like you would choose to explore instead of exploit something, and how it relates to to this um, topic of night, like we humans, we destroy the world, and there's no other way, or something like that. It's. It's similar to uh, what was taught in the course about existential anxieties and, and how you kind of face the, uh, the death, the inevitable death, instead of just not thinking about it and what value may it bring. So it's very similar to thinking, you know, what harm do you cause to environment or, or like uh, relating yourself to no, seeing yourself as part of humanity and and accepting that you also kind of cause harm, you know, destroy the world, and it's it's in a way inevitable because the the more like the the more 
active economically you are, the, the more waste you produce. So, you know, in, in, in a way, you it's inevitable in a way. And, and look, you know, like with, with that, people are, as I see it, going all in on AI and simulation or whatever, just to avoid. I mean, maybe it's possible to to avoid harming Earth. But uh, okay, my final point then is that you know, at least like when you look for value and for purpose in life, it's facing this inevitable death from time to time or or you know accepting that you cause harm it's uh, it may sh shake up your your world your worldview your mindset at least in in this sense it, it may bring some value yeah uh, so it, it's it leads to no conclusions just what i was thinking about <laughs> Um, so we, we're uh, close to the end. I think Matthew, Simon, and me both said also we could stay a little longer. Um, Catherine, you, thanks for coming back. Um, I don't know how much you heard because I was just looking at my slides. That's all I could see. So, but do you want to say anything? Or any any thoughts or conclusions at the end? Um. I, I had missed the presentation and just want to thank you, Nicholas, for that. I'm a bit discombobulated because I'm a bit split attention between the hub and, yeah, not able to stay longer, but happy to leave this running if people are wanting to stay. Or I think I can also pass on the host, actually, probably to someone if you guys want to stay for longer in the Zoom room. Uh I mean, that would be great if you could do either of those things. Maybe I'll do that. Do you, mm -hmm. do you want to continue the recording for this bit? Yeah, I, I, I have it going. You could, you could pass the host oh. on to me, Catherine, if it's Okay. Nicholas, so much for the presentation. And I'll see you guys all soon. See you. I'll put Matthew up there. I I just wanted to what I what I most want to do is respond to you know Simon's question on and and also what you said about uh, Dark Mountain. Mm -hmm. um, is it okay if I just do that and then we see what else mm -hmm. we're gonna say or sure yeah yeah that's good okay so um, I I think. You know, the Dark Mountain people are definitely very much not nihilistic. Their mm. whole thing, I mean, dark, you know, it was, a, it was a, a movement, a very tight group of people, and that's sort of broken apart. People have, you know, they're, they're still in contact. There's a sort of expanding cloud, if you, if you see what I mean, of people going in slightly different directions. Uh, notably, um, Paul Kingsnorth, one, one of the two original writers of the Dark Matter Manifesto, um, has become an Orthodox Christian and talks about the, the machine with capital letters as something that is literally, I think, I don't think he disagree with this, literally demonic and has... Yeah, um, you know, become in many ways quite a right-wing figure quite recently, you know, in the last year. Um, and in other ways, not. Uh, 
so and I can I yeah I've been I've been thinking about that a lot but whatever he whatever the, these different people have that what none of them are at least none of them who are talking about us is is nihilistic they are very much about thinking that our civilization is cannot continue certainly not in this way but that is very much a prompt to find meaning in a different yeah, way. Yeah, I'm, I'm, just to clarify, I'm not suggesting that the actual Dark Mountain people are nihilistic at all. I'm just saying that the, the kind of collapsed discourse has the danger of throwing people into that kind of nihilistic state, that's all. Yeah, so I think... Um, I wanted to go back to that, you know, that first slide that I showed, which had that little picture of Yoda. Mm -hmm. Um and what I'm not, as I said, you know, very early on, I, I don't think mass extinction and civilizational collapse are at all the same thing. And that's mm -hmm. why I'm mm -hmm. having trouble in those groups of people where people are talking about civilizational collapse. Mm -hmm. And in that context, the idea of let's have a have a sort of commune that is, uh, you know, sustainable and be aware that it's there's probably no way it will actually survive the collapse, but maybe it will. And at least it's a model of a good kind of relationship in a good way. You know, that makes sense in that, whereas it mm -hmm. doesn't really make sense in the mass extinction context. But both of those things are still in this kind of, uh, not exactly hierarchy, but but set of, of issues, which starts with our individual mortality. Um, you can respond to mortality with nihilism, but it's also, you know, it, it's the literally the prompt for Buddhism, for example, mm -hmm. the awareness of mortality. Um, so I think Rufus posted something recently, which which was talking about the difference between hope and optimism, and that hope is born from despair in a sense uh because in in a similar way to you know innovation being necessity is the mother of invention that kind of thing um and i think there's that there are sort of different desperate you know mm. despair about your own mortality despair about the collapse of your civilization despair about being inherently the agent of a mass extinction there's a different kinds of despair and give rise to different kinds of you know you know mean you have to search for hope in a, in a different way but there's a similarity between all of them and i think the ways that I, the the approaches that i can see that make sense are five mm -hmm. um firstly what essentially what povelas was saying uh it's you treat this as a as a, a big existential question and you're just attending with curiosity and asking that question the whole time and the point is just not trying to deny it that as a human being we are agents of mass extinction and not trying to say but it, it, it sort of gives meaning it doesn't take away meaning from life unless your meaning is invested in an attachment to a particular idea of with which that conflicts and that just you know so that's one way of looking at it you know, you find meaning by living in reality. Um, and another way of looking at it is, well, if you only look at what's lost, then we are agents of destruction. We could be agents of creation if you allow us to be creative in this way and don't say everything that humans do is breaking the perfect world which yeah. means you have to engage with people who are saying we're going to colonize mars we're going to genetically engineer everything including humanity we've got to 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 uh, you know you've got to engage with that mm -hmm. and not say yeah do it all everything do whatever you like you know the, the the best thing for everything is you get to do whatever you like but on the other hand not say no bad no to everything and that is incredibly hard because there's this, you know, just working in, 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 I had this other slide I wanted to show, but just working in, in, in wildlife conservation, 
you're in this constant, complete moral confusion because if you're working on minimizing human suffering, the terms are pretty clear. But yeah, you know, I can I remember this specific time watching video of a helicopter covering an island, covering an island with poison in order to kill off all the rats who would die this horrible death as their, you know, blood thinned. And think and looking at it and thinking, but they can actually get rid of the rats. There was no way to get rid of the rats. And the birds on this island had no chance and were going to go. But now they can get rid of the rats. There's actually a chance for them. And you're thinking there can be a <laughs> you know the the term is the obvious term is final solution to the problem. And like, what do you even think? It's really hard to know what to think in that situation. And people who see themselves as a sort of right brain type retreating to Eden and saying, this is all evil and wrong and I don't want any part of it and I know it's wrong, I think is not helpful. That's just leaving the others alone with their toys to do what they like. That was, I, sorry, that was a bit of a long one. But, you know, the first one is an existential problem. The second yeah, one is yeah. humans can be yeah. creative as well. Um, yeah. And the third is happiness is not found in the future you know you don't need to be say the future is going to be this or that in order to live now happy that this Simply. is what sorry happiness is not found in the future you know you don't need to say you don't need to have an idea of what the future is going to be like your your job okay. is to live in the present moment yeah the fourth one is to say there's a god and God is, you know, we have to trust in God to sort out the future. That's mm -hmm. sort of um, not, you know, the earth or something that can potentially be defeated by human action, but God, who by definition can't. And the fifth one is just, I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't know. This is, this is an open question. This is the important question that we have to ask here. How can we avoid despair? What's the alternative? Um, but just the alternative is not permaculture. Not that that's a bad thing. And not that I'm picking on permaculture particularly. No, but no, it's not, absolutely. you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, sorry. So. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that there's one one thing that does come back to me though, which is that um, I, I'm aware of being privileged in a couple of different ways. I mean, one is um, I don't want somebody else to list my privileges. Thank you, <laughs> but but, um, but you know, firstly, having having the time, the intellect, the background to think about all these things is in a way, a luxury uh, and realizing that some people don't and some people are struggling for survival and therefore, and therefore they, they eat the birds on Easter Island or whatever is necessary, you know, whatever they need to do to survive. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and, and that we, I mean, may be privileged also in the sense of, of having access to all the information, all the science, all the, all the opinion and everything and all the different viewpoints um which would which would lead i suppose to an educational uh, option you know like well our mission in life is to is to let people know about these things and then they can be more informed they they can be not just more informed because that's more of the sort of just a purely intellectual side but they can be wiser ah that would that brings back rufus a wiser weller world <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering. Matthew just said he'd need to go very soon, so okay, yeah, can, yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Where to? What to say? Um, mm. I do like that last point, though. Simon becoming wiser. Yeah, me too. And um, that's probably the thing that's at least in our power to do, or like the thing that everyone, or, you know, you might try and do. Um, yes. Um, 
there's a lot to say, but I think that 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 wraps it up really nicely. Becoming wiser, whatever whatever wiser means. Um, I think yeah, I w I wish I could leave on a better comment, but I think I do have to head out. Unfortunately, um, I think. Uh, even if I do leave, I think the room can still stay open because I don't think we need a host to be in.